Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to another episode of our Unity tutorial on how to make tile-like movement, the sort of thing you might see in a civilization game, or even a roguelike, uh, and we're going to focus on pathfinding now. We're finally getting to that point, because right now we've got our character here, our unit, that's generic cube, and we can click anywhere and have it instantly teleport there, which is obviously not correct. What we want is, when we're here and we click here, we want the character to walk this way and around the mountain and do all that. So we really have to get started on our actual pathfinding. And for that, we're going to need to discuss a few algorithms. So what we're going to focus on is Dijkstra's, Dijkstra's, I think Dijkstra's algorithm. I don't know, this guy's algorithm. This is sort of the granddaddy of all pathfinding algorithms in that a lot of the others, like say A-star, which is one of the most common ones out there, is uh, basically a subset, a derivative of this algorithm with some optimizations put in. By default, what this tries to do is it tries to search uh, from a start point to a goal point. Um, actually, I, th I think even the technically the goal point is, because this is itself a subset of something else, isn't it? Because it finds a shortest path tree for everything. You don't have to have a goal. Okay, what the hell am I talking about? If we go to this GIF, this is an example. This is our start point. Let me just refresh over here and maybe downsize a little bit. So we've got our start point. And what the algorithm does is it goes out from there. It goes to all attached tiles or nodes, if you want to use proper graph terms. Um, and it calculates the distance from your start point to the node. It knows that from to every single one of these tiles, it knows what the distance is. And you can just let it run and fill the entire screen. And then you know from this point, you know the cost to go anywhere on the map. Now, typically with pathfinding, you do have a goal, which is represented by this green dot over here. And um, in that case, what you would do is when you do hit this goal, finally, then you've got your path. And you just walk backwards through the path along the cheapest route. And you know the cheapest, fastest way to get to your goal. Um, other algorithms like A-star, you can see here, it spends a lot of time going all over the map. What A-star does, if we refresh here, it uses a heuristic to try to guess which direction it should be trying to pathfind in, and it tries to avoid having to scan quite as many tiles. If I can, I don't know if I can, if I put these side by side, minimize that, let me refresh both. I'm going to go refresh, refresh. And if we watch these two, you can see that A-star effectively works much, much, much faster. In fact, if there wasn't this wall here, it would be virtually instantaneous it would have gotten to the goal, whereas this would still be going all over the place. So A-star is going to try to go around there, find the goal, and there you have it. The difference between A-star and Dijkstra is that technically Dijkstra is guaranteed, unless I'm wrong, pretty sure Dijkstra is guaranteed to always find you the most correct, most shortest path. With algorithms like A-star, depending on how their heuristic is put in and what the map layout is, sometimes they might be fooled into taking a slightly more derpy path. It's rare. It doesn't happen very often. In any case, it's always going to be a relatively good path, but every now and again, it can be fooled into doing something a little bit silly. That being said, almost every game uses A-star because it is quite a bit faster. For our purposes, though, we're going to just stick with Dijkstra's because it is a little bit simpler to implement. If we go and compare, and again, let's do a little bit of a side-by-side -side thing here. If we compare the two algorithms, there, and there, uh, where is it? Where's the pseudocode? Keep missing it. Is it higher up? Oh, there it is. We've got that, and we've got that. If you compare the two pseudocode algorithms, the one for Dijkstra's is not quite as long from top to bottom, but also there's a lot more sort of density going on here, and you need um, uh, to keep track of the heuristic cost estimate, which is a whole other function that isn't even represented in here, that sort of thing. Um, so Dijkstra's it will be slightly simpler and will work pretty darn good. And then if you want, you can go ahead and implement A-star later on. These algorithms, which are found on Wikipedia, very handy, are written in pseudocode. You can probably find a version that's already written for you in C-sharp, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be the right implementation for what we're doing. So being able to read algorithms or pseudocode is very handy. I'm going to take this thing and shove it off to the side. I've apparently lost my pseudocode again. There it is here. Let me pan over like that and bring it down. There, there we go. That's pretty good. So we're going to keep this to the side and we're actually just going to start writing this. However, here's the thing. We actually can't start writing the pseudo, the, the pathfinding itself yet because you can see this function wants graph and source. Now source is, um, source is your original tile or yeah. Where your unit is currently standing, that's the source. You'll notice this pseudocode doesn't include anything for a goal because this is the thing that does a full scan. If you scroll down here, it'll point out that you can put in a tiny bit of a change. 
that will allow you to, um, if you have a target, you can stop, you can kill the algorithm at line 13. If the source, if you have the current tile you're looking at is the target, you can stop then, and then you can re reconstruct the path at that point. But all this requires a graph. So we got to go back to talking about that. I don't know if you remember from part one, where we talked about uh, connections between tiles, right? So if I pop in over here, and just pan around like so. So any given tile, like say this one here, is connected to its neighbors based on a rule. Are we doing four-way connections, in which case you can move north, east, south, or west? Or are we doing an uh, eight-way connection, which also includes the diagonals, northeast, um, southeast, etc., etc., etc. If you're doing a hex-type grid, then you've got six connections. Um, and if you're doing something like Europe Universalis 4, then you have a variable number of connections, depending on exactly how many provinces your current province touches. Same with the Voronoi th things, right? So all these, these connections between tiles is represented as a graph. So in a terms, in the sort of terms that you would use in graph theory type stuff, each tile will be a node and each connection to a neighboring node is an edge, right? I mean, you can think of it almost in terms of literally this sort of black line would be the edge, but then it's sort of a bit fuzzy when you're thinking about the, um, the diagonals. Whereas in graph theory, you literally have dot and then a line to another dot. Well, that line that connects one to the other, that's the edge. Uh, so, or the arrow or the direction you can go in. So what we have to do first is we're gonna have to go and construct a graph over here. Now, I will take this time to re-mention, of course, Unity does have built-in pathfinding with nav mes message, me meshes. God, some words, hard to say. Um, also, there's a fantastic pathfinding library that I've used many times in the past, A star pathfinding. If you Google it for Unity, uh, you'll find a website for it that, um, what, Aaron Ehrenberg or something? I can't remember his name. Um, it is great A star pathfinding library and they work in a variety of different environments. They're very generalized. They can work in a big 3D environment, all kinds of stuff. But I think if you're making your own Civ type game or your own dungeon crawler, it's going to be very important for you to implement your own pathfind because A, you'll sort of understand what's going on and you can actually have it work natively with your setup, which will dramatically reduce the overhead. It, the function for it is actually really simple, but first we have to construct the graph. So we're going to go into our tile map uh, script over here. Uh, wait for it to load. We're going to go ahead and bigin it. Um, so our tile map, we are going to add another generate function over here. So I did, of course, you know, I, uh, clean up some of this code into just some separate functions. We generate the map data, we generate the map visuals. So there's going to have to be a step in between here, which is going to be generate graph. Or, I don't know, generate pathfinding graph. Let's make this explicit here. This will describe all the connections between the different tiles. Now, we could, I think do it just fine um, with just you know maybe some extra arrays or something like that i think our life is going to be much much improved if we make a simple data type a simple custom class here to hold some of our data and it is going to be dead simple and i'm just doing it just like how i always save everything in a temporary variable here when i'm doing my tutorials just to make it super explicit even though i could chain these together a little bit more that's part of the reason i'm doing this class so in here we're going to create a custom class and we're going to use the, no the name that graph theory tends to use for things, node. And the node is going to have edges. An edge is simply a connection to a neighboring node, which means what it's going to have to have, it's going to have to have a list of nodes. It's neighbors, really. List, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Unity loves to include system.collections, which I find to be, I never use it, but I do like system.connections generic, which I've mentioned in previous videos. Look this up. This stuff is like some of the greatest, most convenient stuff. So this includes a new class or new object type called list. And we have to give it what kind of item it contains. So this will be a list of nodes. And we could call this edges, or we could call it neighbors. Maybe neighbors is better for this. We'll eschew some of this edge terminology and make it a little bit more explicit. I'm also just as a, just as a convenience factor, I'm going to make a default constructor in this class that just initializes weird that just initializes my list of node I don't know why it's complaining here come on autocomplete work a typo or something oh spelling matters <laughs> all right 
So we have a node which will have a list of neighbors, which are more nodes. Another word for this would be edges. So what we're going to do is are we're going to construct our graph. Our graph is going to be very simple. Our graph is simply going to be an array of nodes, a two-dimensional array of nodes, which literally maps to the number of tiles we have. Graph equals new node. It's going to have a size of, what's, what's the name? Map size X, map size Y. So for every tile, every tile is a node. So we're just creating an array, a two-dimensional array of those tiles again. So really, this can belong right here. It's exactly the same size data structure. It's just these tiles map to a tile type, and this here maps to a node, which just describes who we're touching. Now, it's worth noting, because we're using a square map, a very simple map structure, we don't actually have to pre-generate this graph. When we start doing our pathfinding and we want to know what edges, what our neighbors of a node are, we can actually just calculate that all on the fly, right? Because we'll know, well, it's a square map. We've got one to our left, one above, one to our right, one below us, yada, yada, yada. On the other hand, by pre-generating this, we can put in a variety of extra checks and, and, and balances and different things. Um, you know what? Yeah, this is going to be fine. Technically, the list has slightly more overhead than an array. Um, now yeah, we're, we're going to be okay, possibly go wrong. All right. So we're going to want to loop through our entire map. You know how to do that. That's this kind of code here and close that and close that. We're going to want to loop through our entire map. And then for each node, which is our graph at a certain point, we're going to want to populate the neighbors. Oh, I forgot to make it public me public neighbors now here we can access neighbors excellent so what we're going to be doing is we're going to add in some more neighbors now who do we add well logically let's think about this let's let's assume let's start off by doing a four-way we're doing we have a four-way connected map this also works with six-way hexes eight-way tiles and n-way um, variable areas like u4, right? All of these things will work fine. But so we can assume right now, so we're here, we want to add the neighbor to our left. Okay, we'll start with the four-way because it'll just simplify the code and then we'll go and add the eight-way later on to show that it works both ways. So the neighbor to our left would be um, the node where x minus one. So graph, this is our list of nodes. So x minus 1 and on the same y. So this adds our neighbor to our left or to our west, for example. Now, is there any possibility this won't work? Well, what if we were on the extreme left edge of the map? Then we don't have a neighbor to our left. Or do we? Well, I don't know. It depends. Some games, like classically Civilization, you can loop around the map from left to right and right to left. Right? It's a, a, it's a cylinder map. Most maps in civilization are cylinder maps. And I say cylinder as opposed to spheres because usually you can't go from north to south. So here, if you were at x equals zero, technically you would still have a left neighbor. The left, your left neighbor would be the rightmost node in the map. We're going to assume for simplicity here that you can't loop around. There's no, the edges are, are fixed. You can't loop. So what we have to do if, if x is equal to zero, or rather, if x is not equal to zero, or even if x is greater than zero, either way, as long as we're not on the left edge of the map, we can add our leftmost neighbor. And then we're going to do the same thing for the right edge of the map. And how does that work? Well, we know that the, the map has a size of x. And we know, for in our example, right now our map size is 10 in the x direction, which means our legal coordinates go from zero to nine, right? We have a width of 10, then our legal coordinates go from 0 to 9. We want to make sure that we are not in that ninth spot. So we want to say, as long as x is less than map size minus 1. So map size minus 1 would be 9, so we want to be less than 9. So as long as we're not in that ninth spot, means we have a neighbor to our right, which is plus 1. And then we'll do the same thing for the y's, which you can mostly do by copy and pasting. y, y, that... In this case, now the x will stay the same, and instead we'll be doing y minus 1 and y plus 1. 
like so. So now we have a four-way connected map. It should be pretty obvious how you would implement the eight-way at this point, which is just you're also checking for diagonals and doing different things like that. And then the n-way one, um, if you're auto-generating with the Voronoi, then there's, there's ways to calculate it. And in EU4, they basically have this all written ahead of time, which, um, which provinces are adjacent to which provinces. That's just sort of pre-programmed in. Um, but this will work fine. So now we have a graph. So the next thing is, this move selected units too, we need to use this map, this, this graph, to actually do some pathfinding using this algorithm that we were talking about before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prep things over here. So instead of teleporting instantly, I'm just going to comment this stuff out. I'm going to just comment it out for now and then move down. And in the next video, we are going to go, we're going to translate this into our system here, which means, you know, slightly different variable names. Like there's a lot of placeholder here, diff, dist, prev, graph, q, um, First of all, I don't actually like these names. Um, I don't think they're descriptive enough. And also, like we are using specific units in a specific thing. We're using we're using vectors, like um, you know, vector threes for our position. We're using integers for our coordinates, and so on and so forth. So the, we'll be basically writing this, but in C sharp and with our particular uh, variable names and so on. So that'll have to wait until next time. Thank you very much for watching. Bye bye.